I'm Professor Kenneth Hansen of the University of Central Florida Judaic Studies Program, and I'd like to share some exciting new backstories gleaned from the Hebrew Bible with a little help from AI. With a discerning eye, some help from a couple of famous detectives, and an archaeologist adventurer who might look familiar, we might be able to uncover the dawn of an amazing genre of biblical literature, focusing on the end of days, a term called eschatology, and revealing itself in a series of ancient writings that we can rightly call apocalyptic. Of course, we have to go back, way back, into the distant biblical past. There's plenty of intrigue, there are multiple monarchs, and through it all, we're basically looking at a Game of Thrones. When most people read through the Hebrew Bible, it's rare that they have any sense of the kind of conflicts going on in determining what kind of government would lead the ancient Israelites. We're told that the people approached the great prophet Samuel, asking that he appoint for them a king, like all other nations. Samuel warned them in the harshest of terms that a king would oppress and ultimately enslave them. ויאמר זה יהיה משפט המלך אשר ימלוך עליכם, את בניכם ייקח ושם לו במרכבתו ובפרשיו, ורצו לפני מרכבתו, וזעקתם ביום ההוא, מלפני מלכיכם אשר בחרתם לכם, ולא יענה השם אתכם ביום ההוא. This will be the manner of the king who shall reign over you. He will take your sons, and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots, and you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But Samuel ultimately acquiesced and appointed a young man named Saul. Up until now, the land had been ruled by judges, who arose at the time of need to lead the people in battle. Now, however, the ad hoc tribal confederacy of the past would give way to a hardened monarchy. Samuel nonetheless remained on the sidelines, more than willing to provide consultation and even appoint another king, namely David, as the need arose. Thus, he created history's first system of checks and balances the prophet serving as a buffer against the king. According to this so-called Samuel Compromise, the old office of judge was divided into two separate offices, the king wielding temporal power and the prophet exercising spiritual authority. The king was charged with political responsibility as a military leader. To the prophet fell the task of discerning the divine will that would hold true throughout the reign of King David when the prophet Nathan confronted him over his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. For centuries thereafter, the coexistence between king and prophet would be one of constant tension. And that's where we need some good textual sleuthing. Right, Sherlock? Let's travel back to the days of the wise King Solomon. At least that's how he's traditionally conceived. But if you were an ancient Israelite prophet, you wouldn't have seen him in such a positive light. Solomon, we recall, was supported by one high priest, named Zadok, from the line of Aaron, but he exiled the rival high priest Abiathar, who was descended from Moses himself, to a northern town called Anathoth. In fact, it was arguably King Solomon who drove the prophetic tradition into eclipse, as there was no room for it in the high monarchy that now reigned supreme in Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah. The prophets were further suppressed by Solomon's son and successor Rehoboam. But they remained active in the north, being cultivated by the successors of Moses, the so-called Mushites. When the Israelite nation split apart during Rehoboam's reign, the ten northern tribes established their own monarchy, which became increasingly authoritarian. The so-called Omri dynasty, under the likes of the notorious King Ahab, saw the imposition of monarchy based on a foreign idea of an all-powerful king, leaving no room for prophets or the Samuel Compromise. The prophets, for their part, fought back. As the world's greatest detective, H.P. for short, whom you just might recognize from my favorite novelist, 
I would agree with you, Sherlock. The prophets did indeed fight back. That's the backstory behind the famous northern prophets Elijah and Elisha. Elijah confronts Ahab and challenges the prophets of Baal, imported into the land by Queen Jezebel. In the end, Elijah has the pagan prophets rounded up and slain. Elijah is persecuted, however, and must flee to the holy mountain, called Horeb in the northern tradition. Eventually, he's taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire, passing his mantle to his apprentice, Elisha. In the south, the spirit of prophecy was revived as well from the 8th century BCE onward with the likes of Isaiah, who greatly influenced King Hezekiah in particular. But the ongoing conflict between king and prophet would come to a head in the 7th century BCE, when a prophet who hailed from Anathot, from the Mushite or Moses priestly line, found himself in a battle royale with the reigning king, Zedekiah. His name was Jeremiah, son of someone named Hilkiah, and with a little sleuthing we can deduce that this was the high priest Hilkiah who served in the temple. Decades earlier, in the days of King Josiah, the high priest Hilkiah, while renovating the temple, found a book of the law, the words of Moses himself, that had long been overlooked and its existence forgotten. When the scroll was shown to the king, he tore his clothes in anguish and initiated a great religious renewal in the kingdom of Judah. The pagan altars were torn down and worship was centralized in the Jerusalem temple. Up until now the Jerusalem temple was ruled by the Zadokite priesthood from the line of Aaron, headquartered in the southern territory of Judah. The writer of the J source, possibly a woman, seems to have allied with them. Now at last, the northern priesthood from Shiloh, the Mushites, from whose circle came the Elohist, or E source, again had access to the sacred shrine. Indeed, Sherlock, most scholars are in agreement that the scroll found in the temple by Hilkiah was the book of Deuteronomy, which some suggest was actually set down in writing in the north, at the hands of the Mushites, and ascribed backwards to Moses, then brought south to Jerusalem, where it was conveniently found in the temple. All of this once again emphasizes the deep division between the ruling class in Jerusalem and the renegades exiled in the days of King Solomon. It's true that some have referred to Deuteronomy as nothing less than a pious fraud, but it's also possible that the core of the book goes far back into antiquity, perhaps to Moses himself, and was expanded upon by a later editor. There was in fact an abbreviated parchment of Deuteronomy, reportedly found in Transjordan by the Bedouin in the late 19th century, uh, that might represent that very abbreviated text. It's been called the Valediction of Moses, or simply the Moses Scroll. It was denounced as a forgery not long after being displayed in the British Museum in London, and it subsequently vanished, with only handwritten facsimiles of the contents remaining. Still highly controversial, it represents what might have been a forerunner of the book of Deuteronomy we know today. Incredibly, there are striking parallels between canonical Deuteronomy and the book of Jeremiah, which leads some to suggest that the prophet himself or his scribe Baruch may have had a hand in writing it or enlarging the earlier copy. Jeremiah, after all, was the son of the high priest Hilkiah, who claimed to have found it in the temple. While the e-source, the rise to have been composed by the Mushites, references the portable tabernacle, as opposed to the Ark of the Covenant, which permanently rested in the Jerusalem temple, Deuteronomy indeed mentions the ark during the days of the one southern king, who welcomed a northerner, Hilkiah, into his royal court. But the rapprochement between the Yahwists in Judah and the Muzhite Elohists in the north would be short-lived, as the sons of Josiah pursued a course of folly. Failing to recognize that the only way the kingdom could survive would be to make concessions to the Babylonians, they chose rebellion. As King Zedekiah came to the throne, the Aranid Zadokites were back in power, with no room for the Muzhite Abiathar lineage. 
that was when the prophet Jeremiah physically showed up in Jerusalem. The tension between the prophetic class and the hierocratic rulers of the temple returned with a vengeance. Hadavar asher haya el Yirmeyahu meet Hashem lemor, amod bashar bet Hashem, vekarat Hashem et hadavar haze, hamarat parzim haya habayt haze asher nikra shmi alav beinechem, gam anochi hine raiti neum Hashem. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. Has this house, whereupon my name is called, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. Jeremiah then references divine punishment on the city of Shiloh, the early headquarters of the Muzhite priesthood. <laughs> אשר בשילו, אשר שכנתי שמי שם בראשונה, וראו את אשר עשיתי לו מפני רעת עמי ישראל. For go now to my place which was in שילו, where I caused my name to dwell at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Again we see the schism between the Aaronid priesthood in the south, who gave birth to the Bible's J, or Yahweh's source, and the northern Mushite line. Recall that it was likely a Mushite from Shiloh who composed the E, or Elohis source. Jeremiah, who identified with this group, had a stern and powerful message. If even Shiloh could be ravaged, what about Jerusalem? When the Babylonians stood poised to conquer, Jeremiah was compelled to explain the catastrophe in terms of the waywardness of the people. Though it's now clear that the only course of survival is to submit to Babylonia's King Nebuchadnezzar, King Jehoiakim refuses to pay tribute and trusts instead in Egypt, hoping that they will defeat the Babylonians. Jeremiah warns him, writing his prophecies in a scroll and reading them aloud in the temple. The king is so enraged that he slices up the scroll, column by column, and throws it into the fire. In the end, King Nebuchadnezzar kills the Judean leaders, including Jehoiakim. His son, Jehoiachin, succeeds him. Nebuchadnezzar, for his part, doesn't destroy Jerusalem, but he fears more rebellion and carts away the sacred vessels from the temple, along with the king, who will now live in exile. Jehoiachin is replaced by one of the sons of Josiah, his uncle Zedekiah. A priest named Pashur has Jeremiah arrested and flogged and put in stocks. The prophet acts out his message by walking through the streets of Jerusalem with an ox yoke around his neck, symbolizing the captivity to come. He is confronted by a false prophet named Hananiah, who breaks the yoke in pieces. Jeremiah is thrown into a cistern and left to die, only to be rescued by an Ethiopian eunuch. In the year 586 BCE, Jerusalem is taken. The sons of Zedekiah are executed in front of his eyes. Then the king is blinded and deported to Babylonia. A puppet governor named Gedaliah is installed only to be assassinated by die-hard zealots. But once his people have been conquered, the prophet's oracles turn to comfort and hope. Ki kho amar Hashem tzvaot Elohei Yisrael, od yikanu batim vesadot uchramim ba'aretz hazot. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Some time later, the prophet is dragged by sympathizers down to Egypt, where he finds a contingent of Jews who, having fled to the region of the Nile Delta, have abandoned Israel's deity. He comes to understand, after the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, that outward rituals are only symbolic of an inward condition of the mind and heart. He writes of a new covenant, 
which we should really understand as a renewed covenant, not replacing the Torah, but inscribing it, as it were, in people's souls. Returning to the curious, abbreviated version of Deuteronomy known as the Valediction of Moses, it's been speculated that the copy of the law that Jeremiah sent with the exiles into captivity may have been this very text. Additionally, the Book of Two Maccabees tells us that immediately before the Temple's destruction, Jeremiah rescued the Ark of the Covenant and hid it in a desert cave. The Book of Deuteronomy itself tells us that a copy of the law should be stored next to the Ark, and some have suggested inside the Ark. Perhaps Jeremiah felt that at some future day, when the people return from their captivity, they will have no more need of the Book of the Law, as it will be written in their hearts. Jeremiah 31 references this new covenant, as he calls it. The theory may be far-fetched, but it may at least explain how an ancient scroll, representing a shortened form of Deuteronomy, ended up in a cave in Transjordan, to be discovered by Bedouin in the late 19th century. In any case, what we read in Jeremiah 31, as a vision of spiritual renewal in the end of days, perfectly illustrates how the bitter tension between Jerusalem's priestly hierarchy and the marginalized Mushites would prompt the latter group to cultivate a rival spirituality of their own. It would be characterized by a focus on the end of days, which at the time of Jeremiah we can refer to as prophetic eschatology, or apocalyptic eschatology, and those who wrote down their special revelations we can refer to by a new term, the visionaries. Tracing their story and finding their works sandwiched into multiple texts during the centuries that follow is what good biblical sleuthing is all about.